So hi guys and welcome to lesson five of the geochemical data series. So in this lesson I'm going to be talking about common radiogenic isotopes and their applications to geological systems. So an isotope is two or more forms of the same element with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. So because they have the same number of protons they have the same atomic number but because of those neutrons they have a different atomic mass. And then because of their different atomic mass, they can behave differently during geological processes. Then we get to the terms radioactive and radiogenic. So radioactive is essentially an element that can decay, and radiogenic is essentially an element that is the product of decay. So we have a radioactive parent isotope and a radiogenic daughter isotope, and that corresponds to the definition just below. Then we have a half-life, which is the time taken for a parent isotope to decay by half its original quantity. And it's through using this in, in equations that I'm going to show in the following slides, we can determine the age of a rock or a mineral. Geochronology is a term for dating rocks. Minerals that we date are sometimes referred to as geochronometers. And then an isochron is a line on a geochronological diagram that connects two or more points that correspond to the same age. I'll give a couple examples of this as well. There are three common ways a radioactive isotope can decay to a radiogenic daughter isotope, the first of which is alpha decay, which occurs in proton-rich nucleides, so that is nuclides that have high atomic numbers. And these will become unstable and emit what's known as an alpha particle. An alpha particle is a helium-4 atom, and helium 4 atom is something that has two protons and two neutrons, so it has an atomic number of two and an atomic mass of four. And because of this, during the emission of this particle, the element decreases by four in atomic mass and by two in atomic number. And this causes a change in the element. A good example of this is uranium to lead. So we have different daughter and parent elements. Beta decay, there is two types. There's both positive and negative beta decay. So positive decay occurs in proton-rich, so P, proton, uh, nuclides, where a proton is converted to a neutron by emission of a positron and neutrino. So the atomic mass changes, so sorry, the atomic mass stays the same, but the atomic number changes. Negative decay is essentially the opposite, where we have a neutron-rich nuclide and a neutron is converted to a proton by the emission of an electron and anti-neutrino. And thirdly, we have gamma decay. So this is essentially a secondary process to other forms of decay like alpha or beta decay. Because during these primary decay processes, the atom may become excited or enter what's known as a high energy state. It may emit a photon, causing it to enter a lower energy state and thus stabilize the atom. There are a number of radiogenic isotope systems we use for geological purposes and they're tabulated to the right of the slide there and are going to be giving examples of uranium, lead, rubidium, strontium and samarium, neodymium. So there's two primary uses for radiogenic isotopes. These are geochronometers, those which can tell us the date of a rock, and petrogenetic tracers, those which can tell us a bit more about the source or contamination or mixing or processes that led to the formation of that particular rock. And they can be measured from whole rocks, so we have powdered samples of whole rock, and we can measure things like rubidium strontium or samarium neodymium, or we can measure them directly in situ in minerals. So we can measure the isotopic composition of minerals directly, and most common minerals that we use are things like zircon for uranium lead or plagioclase for strontium, etc. All of these systems are sort of you know, project dependent. We would take a look at what needs to be done, i.e. what needs to be dated, what questions need to resolve, and we would select the, the right isotopic system for the job. So I'll start with the uranium lead isotope system, which is arguably the best understood and most widely used isotopic system in geology. It starts with three radioactive parent isotopes of uranium-238, uranium-235 and thorium-232. And these elements undergo a series of alpha and beta decay, as illustrated in the diagram on the slide, to produce daughter isotopes of lead-206, lead-207 and lead-208, respectively. It is noted that lead also has a fourth isotope, which is lead-204, and this is the stable isotope of lead that is quite common in the crust. 
So just below uh, that paragraph, we have um, the decay constants for these different isotope systems. So for example, uranium-238 decays to lead-206 at a decay constant of 1.551 times 10 to the power of minus 10, which corresponds to a half-life of around, around 4.5 billion years. But as you can see in this diagram, it tells us the half-life during each of these different episodes of alpha and beta decay. So you can see that actually this is a cumulative half-life and each of these atoms as they undergo alpha and beta decay each have an individual half-life which is listed in some of those there. So we can use the concentrations of lead isotopes to generate what's known as an isochron. I won't be given an example of lead as I'll be talking about that in rubidium, strontium and samarium neodymium. And we can use them also as a petrogenetic tracer to tell us more about our rocks, i.e. things like contamination. However, the most common use for uranium lead is the dating of zircons. So zircons are zirconium silicate minerals. Um, these are robust and resilient minerals. And they're really useful for dating rocks because during the time of their formation, radioactive uranium is uh, compatible within the zircon crystal lattice. However, common 204 lead is not. So when we analyze the zircon over time, it's been undergoing decay. All the lead that we would analyze in that zircon is radiogenic. So it is the product of the, the decay of uranium, of radioactive uranium isotopes. So we generally present uranium lead data on what's known as Wetherill Concordia plots, which is the example I've given in the slide, or as Terra Wasserberg diagrams. Um, both diagrams essentially tell us the same thing with slightly different axes titles. Um, so a Wetherill Concordia plot on the x-axis has a radiogenic 207 lead over 235 uranium. And then on the y-axis, we have 206 lead over 238 uranium. Now, if our uranium decay systems are in equilibrium, so i.e. the ages are equal for the material that we've analysed, we produce an ideal line, which is known as a Concordia plot, which is an orange curve that we're seeing in that plot. So any samples that plot along this line are generally considered to be concordant, and the uranium isotope systems are in equilibrium in that particular rock or mineral. However, samples can plot outside of this line, and that is known as discordia. And discordia can arise from the loss or addition of lead or uranium to the sample that we're analysing. The most common problem that we can see in these plots is lead loss. So because of the behaviour of lead um, during sort of episodes such as metamorphism or tectonism, a zircon would lose the radiogenic daughter isotopes of lead proportionally. And because of this, anything that has experienced lead loss will plot below the Concordia curve. So let's take an example. Say we analyse a zircon that crystallised at around 4 GA, but then it experienced metamorphism at around 2 GA, so 2 billion years old. If it experienced lead loss at this episode of metamorphism at 2 GA, our samples would plot somewhere in the middle here. So that, lit, that middle blue circle corresponds to around 50% lead loss. And then either side we have 25 and 75% lead loss. Now these form an array. Because we lose those radiogenic lead isotopes proportionally, they can form a linear array. So then we can draw a line for this linear array and that connects our crystallization age of 4 and then our alteration age of 2. Then going to the rubidium strontium isotope systems where we have to date we have to use these methods to date rocks slightly differently to the uranium lead system. So rubidium strontium isotope system can be used to date rocks but can also be used as a petrogenetic tracer. So radioactive rubidium 87 decays to radiogenic strontium 87 by beta negative decay with a half-life of around 49 billion years and a decay constant of 1.4 times 10 to the power of 11. When we analyse our rock or mineral, we don't know the amount of radiogenic strontium-87 that was initially present in our rock. However, we do know the stable isotope of strontium-86 does not change in concentration through time. And because of this relationship, we can produce the isochron equation that's presented at the top right of the slide, where we have radiogenic strontium-87 divided by strontium-86, which is our stable isotope. And then we have our E lambda, lambda being our decay constant and T being time. The only things we don't know in this equation is our initial strontium-87-86 ratio and the time of crystallization. 
So during rock formation, if there's no alteration, the strontium-87, strontium-86 ratio should all be the same. And that leads to that straight line that we see connecting points A to C. However, the minerals that crystallize, so if we, if we take A, B and C as different mineral phases, they all start with the same strontium ratio because they're equally compatible within that mineral lattice, so you'd expect them to concentrate proportionally. However, they might incorporate different concentrations of radioactive rubidium-87. And because they're likely to have incorporated different concentrations of radioactive rubidium-87, over time this will decay to radiogenic strontium-87, and therefore the strontium-87-86 ratio will variably increase over time for different phases. And that leads to separate phases of A-, B- and C-. We can connect A-, B- and C- through linear regression, or what's also known as an isochron. And this isochron will give us an initial strontium-87, strontium-86 ratio. And then we can plug that into our equation at the top and we can determine the age of the rock that way. We can also use rubidium strontium as a petrogenetic tracer. So once we've determined the initial strontium-87-86 ratio, we can use this as a geological tracer or petrogenetic tracer. How it works is that the crust has higher strontium-87-86 ratios than mantle rocks, and that's because during differentiation at around 2.7 billion years ago, um, the crust preferentially concentrates radioactive rubidium in contrast to uh, the stabilizer type of strontium. It means that in the crust, the strontium-87-86 ratio increases over time at a much faster rate than that for mantle rocks. So if we, so let me, you know, take my cursor here, for example. So we start off with our undifferentiated earth, and then we differentiate into mantle and crust. Because that crust concentrates rubidium, we lead to higher 87-86 ratios because we're generating more strontium-87 by the decay of the higher concentrations of rubidium. Conversely, in the mantle, we have smaller amounts of rubidium, so the degree of decay to strontium-87 is lower, so we generate lower ratios. Now, we can plot a diagram like this where we have our age across the bottom that we've determined from our isochron and then our initial 87-86 ratio up the y-axis. You can see that over time, the evolution of crust gets much more as we continuously decay all that rubidium, whereas the growth curve for mantle rocks is much shallower. Therefore, samples that plot you know, up towards the crust to generally arrive from crustal rocks and then those that plot on the mantle curve uh, derive from the mantle. If they plot somewhere in the middle, we would presume that our, our igneous rock or our magma parental to our igneous rock has undergone some degree of interaction with the continental crust. So going into the Samarium neodymium isotope system, it has a lot of similarities with the rubidium strontium isotope system. We can also use Samarium neodymium to date rocks and also as a petrogenetic tracer. So samarium-147 decays to neodymium-143 by alpha decay, which is the emission of a helium-4 particle. And this has a half-life of around 106 billion years and a decay constant of 6.54 times 10 to the power of minus 12. So just as we did for rubidium strontium, we don't know the amount of initial radiogenic neodymium-143. However, we do know the stabilized type of neodymium-144 does not change in concentration through time, and just as before, we can produce the isochron equation to the top right, where we have our radiogenic isotope divided by our stable isotope. And just as before, we don't know the initial ratio, which is denoted by that subscripted zero, which I can guess I can circle with my cursor here, and we also don't know the time, so t. During rock formation, if we have no alteration, the neodymium-143-144 ratio should be the same, just as before. So each of our different mineral phases, A, B, and C, will incorporate the same amounts of radiogenic and stable neodymium, but the phases may incorporate different concentrations of radioactive samarium. So over time, the different proportions of radioactive samarium will decay and it will form respectively A dash, B dash and C dash. And then through linear regression, we can draw our isochron between these phases and generate the initial neodymium-143-144, complete the equation and generate an isochron age. The samarium neodymium system in terms of a petrogenetic tracer once we've determined neodymium-143-144, 
During differentiation, neodymium 144 concentrates in the crust, so our stable neodymium concentrates in the crust, while samarium 143 concentrates in the mantle. Therefore, the mantle has a higher concentration of radiogenic neodymium over time due to the decay of samarium 147. So, as we do not believe that rare earth elements fractionated during early earth processes, we believe that the samarium neodymium ratios of early earth is the same as chondritic materials. So, we can compare rocks today with the chondritic uniform reservoir denoted as CHER via the equation below. And through this equation, we can determine things like source of the magma and contamination. So, when we take the 143 neodymium 144 of our sample and we divide it by that of CHER, so our chondritic reservoir, we generate what's known as epsilon neodymium. Because the half-life of samarium neodymium is so large, we produce this epsilon neodymium value and we multiply it by 10,000 because the changes in concentrations are so small. So the diagram to the top right is, so we have our isochron age across the bottom. So just as we did for strontium, we have our isochron age at the bottom. We have our initial 143, 144 neodymium. We can see the evolution of bulk earth, but during differentiation, we can see because our mantle has a lot more radiogenic neodymium in it, so it has a much steeper curve than um, compared with our continental crust, which has a much shallower curve because it incorporates stable neodymium, but it doesn't incorporate radioactive samarium as much as mantle rocks. And then the diagram to below is time, just as above, but instead we have now our equation of epsilon neodymium. So we've essentially normalized the concentration to CHER. So CHER is our um, sort of straight line we have here at zero epsilon neodymium. We see our depleted mantle evolving just as we'd expect with higher concentrations of um, radioactive or radiogenic neodymium, sorry, and then our crust with the lower radiogenic neodymium. If a sample plots up here on depleted mantle, we can assume that it's derived from the mantle and hasn't undergone any interaction with the crust. However, if it plots somewhere here, as denoted by these dashed lines with a mix, so I mean that it's been a mix between crust and mantle. And we can compare our samarium and neodymium isotopic ratios, and we can plot them on a diagram such as this, where we have our bulk silicate earth lines, and we have our mantle array for the two isotope systems, and then depleted mantle as well. And then we also have continental crust here. So just, so just as before, right, continental crust, we concentrate rubidium and we concentrate stable neodymium. So we'd have high strontium 8786 ratios and low neodymium 143-144 ratios. And then we can produce a diagram like this because these isotope systems are commonly used together. And we can plot whether our rocks have derived from the mantle, whether they've derived from the crust, or if they're a mixture of the two. So thanks for listening. I hope you found this helpful. Uh, stay in the loop by clicking subscribe and I hopefully see you in the next and last lesson of this series. Thank you.